Coming to you from the city where Albert Einstein's eyeballs are stored in a safe deposit box, it's Ventriloquism Weekly. It's Monday again. Woo! Welcome back. I'm Matt Bailey, and we have a great guest today. Megan Casey is a bright ventriloquist with a wonderful future ahead of her with puppets. Already performing over 50 library shows each summer and more on the weekends during the school year, Megan is constantly chasing her passion. Here now to tell us exactly how pursuing a psychology major at Colorado State University fits into all of this, her master plan, and you're going to love her answer, our interview with Megan Casey. Megan Casey, welcome to Ventriloquism Weekly. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much for being here. This is going to be so much fun. Yes, it's awesome to be on this. Yes. Well, it's, it's awesome to have you. Now, I want to begin at the beginning. How did you get started in ventriloquism? I got started with my dad. Um, actually, when I was little, um, I saw that he, like, he always read to me with puppets and stuff when I was little, learning how to read and stuff. And when I was five, I saw my dad's lips move, and I was like, wait, you're, you're making him talk. <laughs> He's like, well, no, I'm not. He's like, trying to hide it from me, and I was like, no, I want to learn how to do it. And uh, so then uh, he got the mayor course for me, and I really wanted to go to the Ventriloquist Convention at that time. And then he was like, no, 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 you have to you please to go to the Ventriloquist Convention. So I knocked that course out in about a month. <laughs> and uh, he, he helped me read and stuff, so learning how to read and whatnot. But yeah, that's how I got started in it. And they've watched you grow up. What was your What was your first year at the convention? My first year at the convention was when I was six, so 2006. Hey, not 2006, no, just kidding. Like, I'm not that young. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, I think it was 2001 is when my first convention was. Very cool. We won't... Uh... Yeah, so, yeah. I won't do the math because I'm not a math major and we don't want to ask you your age, but we know that you're <laughs> now, that you are in college now. Uh, so uh, so it's been quite a journey for you in ventriloquism. Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, what was the what was the spark? Was it that your dad did it? What what uh, when you started doing it, what made you say, OK, I'm going to stick with it? Um. So my dad did another really reason why I was really wanted to stick with it because my dad my dad was my role model. I mean, I look up to him for a lot of things, and I, I thought I wanted to be just like him. And the stuff years, I started I started to grow a love for it, and um, it's just kind of like an extension of who I am now. And things really started to click with ventriloquism. The past four years, I would say, when I first got my Diamond Star puppet from Steve Axel and I named him Aiden. Yes. It's, it's kind of creepy. I feel like I'm talking to him and he's talking like he, he, he's talking to, he's talking back to me about me making him talk. So I feel like he's just real. It's, it's weird. But uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of ventriloquists probably relate to what that family is. That's the mark of a signature character when, when that headspace for the ventriloquist yep. is just so second nature. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, talk about the creation of Aiden. You say he's only about four uh, in terms of you're using him. Uh, how did he yeah. come about? Because now everybody, especially at the convention and with all the shows that you do all around, uh, uh, all around, which we'll get to also, but um, creating Aiden, um, what was the spark just four years ago, having done it for nine years prior? Um, when did that come about for you? Um. So when I first saw Aiden, the dinosaur puppet at the convention, I think that was seven years ago was when I first saw him, but I, my, my dad, I told him that I really wanted to take a little save up for him, and Aiden was actually my first puppet that I bought with my own money. And um, it just, I kind of picked him up and we clicked. Um, Steve Petra was there at the table. I think he, he here kind of remember me picking up Aiden and just kind of how I just clicked with him. It, it felt like I was going to make him talk. And uh, personality-wise, uh, I just he had that little kiddish look to him. So I wanted him to have that voice that's kind of like a toddler. So he's four years old, and he will always say four years old. 
But one of them had that toddler voice, so I had the, I like how I look. Just kind of, kind of hard to understand, but kids are very adaptive to that. They can relate to that. And mm-hmm. he's my most favorite puppet. Like, he's the most favorite puppet that I have. And um, the, he's the most favorite puppet that the kids in the audience that I do shows for. And that's their favorite puppet. And they're like, oh, he's so funny. And I just kind of um, have that personality of, oh, um, I know everything. Um, you're not going to tell me otherwise. And like, a lot of toddlers are like that. But they just, I tried to think of how a toddler would act. And that's basically where his personality came off of. Wonderful. And what, so what other characters do you have that work off of Aiden? You say that they're, um, excuse me, that they're, the favorite one of your shows. Yeah. Uh, how do you mm-hmm. work your other characters around sort of the star that is Aiden? Um, so uh, every year I do a different theme show for the library. So, I mean, it kind of depends on what uh, really the scene is. And um, Aiden's always the main character just because kids always click with that. And they remember that character. So every time they bring them back to a library show, they're like, oh, I've, I've seen them before. I really like this person who does the show. He says, I really like Aiden. So whenever I have, like, the other characters and stuff, um, the other characters just kind of go along with it. I use I use basically all of it. So um, I have a shark puppet that I use that just kind of goes along with um, this. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, but here's one thing that I have. I have a theme show where it's a castle. And instead of alligators being in a moat, I have a shark inside a moat. So that's <laughs> Aiden's castle. I just kind of go along with how the shark protects Aiden's castle. And then I actually just got the new puppy love puppet from Axel, and that's the watchdog of the castle. So everything is kind of Aiden's um, security guard, or in a way, kind of, because Aiden's very popular out of all the puppets that I have. So it's kind of like a protective puppet in a way. I'm not really sure how to put that, but yeah. Absolutely, that's that's very good. And you touch on something with your uh, with your theme shows. How do you come up with your shows? Because what we know you for from the convention is mm-hmm. not just getting up there and doing a routine, but doing, for lack of a better term, I hate this word, so forgive me, a skit. It's it's <laughs> it's a show. It's um, it's it's a little play as opposed to just doing a a straight uh, standing up with just puppet and the vent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why that I, format? And how do you come up with the ideas to keep it fresh and original? Yeah. Um, my dad helped me, helped me come up with a lot of the ideas. My dad is so original with everything that he does. So I got my really bounce ideas back and forth. And that's basically where my shows come from. Like most, like most comedians do, they bounce ideas back and forth when they're trying to come up with a show. And then if they write something, they put it in the show. Um, I know the, shows are very elaborate and stuff that I do, but the reason why I make it so elaborate is then people remember that. People will be like, oh, I remember that. I actually, the past year convention, like, remember that one year at the convention when you had a giant bed on the stage and you did the Tooth Fairy skit? And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I had another one where it was a GPS skit where I had just a little toy car on the stage and I actually get in the car. Just I try to make it very theatrical so people remember it. And that, that... Um, it just kind of sticks with them. Yeah, that's one of the ones that uh, that stick out in uh, in my mind because uh, I think that was I'm not sure how many years ago you did, but I just a few years ago I had to miss a couple conventions. So one of the ones that uh, I remember is the is the one where you were in the in the little toy car. <laughs> there was just so yeah, much yeah. stuff <laughs> on stage, and I was like, man, she went all out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I got a couple other crazy ones, but I always try to be elaborate. Even when I go do my library show stuff, uh, this past year was just doing raves on the library, so I had literally a giant laboratory set up behind the stage. I mean, it took a while to set up, but it was well worth it in the end because kids remember that. And last year for the dig into reading theme that the libraries had, that's where I did the castle thing, and we had to try and dig and find the treasure, and the treasure was reading. So just all these giant stage setups make it really memorable for people to kind of just recall skits and just remember someone. And that's I like being remembered for stuff that I do that I work really hard for. So absolutely, I like doing that. But yeah, 
Absolutely. And talk and talk a little bit more about it being worth it. Because I know a lot of us, sometimes me included, especially being in New York, is just like, I want to throw the puppet in the bag, get in the car and go. And really ha- have nothing to worry about in terms of lugging stuff, maybe a speaker if, if the venue needs it. But uh, can you talk about the worth of of loading all that extra stuff in and out, what it does for the production quality of a show and maybe why others uh, might want to follow suit and uh, add more production value to their event show. Oh, yeah. So it's it's pretty, it's pretty easy for us to pack up. I mean, the first few shows that I did, it was kind of hard to pack stuff up very, fairly quickly just because we were starting to get the hang of things, get the king and new stuff together. Um but my dad and I have these Stanley cases, these giant Stanley cases. I have mm-hmm. a somewhat smaller, like a, uh, I don't know, it's kind of small, but then I also have a really, really big one that holds all the puppets that I bring. I bring around six puppets to the show because they do shows for kids and their attention span doesn't last too long. That's why I put a whole bunch of puppets to the show. So I literally bring almost every puppet that I have, well, all the actual puppets that I have, just to kind of entertain kids after the show, too. So that's one thing I do. But uh, as far as sound system goes, um, usually libraries provide the sound system, so that's one thing that I don't need to bring that often. But I do have a little sound system, and it's pretty powerful. It's uh, like 1,100 watts or something like that. I don't know um, exactly what, what the power is again, but it's pretty strong, and it's really loud. I mean, I can use that for a room filled with 500 people, and you'll be able to hear me just fine. Um, that's probably one of the greatest investments I ever made. Um, mm-hmm. I can't, it's, it's an alpha, alpha wolf. I can't remember what the name of it is called, but um, I use that for my shows because it is so tiny. Just, I'm trying to think small in terms of packing stuff. Otherwise, if I get too big, then it's going to be really hard to start packing stuff up. So I definitely have to put that in the mind when I'm putting together together the show. So this upcoming year, it's a superhero theme. And um, I'm not really sure how we're going to do that because I, I have this whole giant elaborate setup put in my head, but I'm not sure how that uh, would be easy enough for me to take up and put down considering I could be doing three to four shows in a day. So that's always a struggle when trying to get place to place to place when you have a certain time you have to be there. So, yeah, I would be like doing the um, elaborate setup. So it's, it's easy once you get the hang of it. Right, pack small plays big, and it plays very big, huh? <laughs> yep. So you touched on something, three to four shows a day. What is the key for someone, and I don't mean this in any offensive way, for someone so young, um, just in college, and um, I'm sure you were in high school, working all over uh, and just working an incredible amount? I know you worked, I think I, I, think I saw a Facebook status where you said that you did more this summer than you've done in quite a while. So what yeah. is, uh, what's the key to really jumping in and getting a lot of work, especially at a young age? That's what I mean. I don't mean to offend being so young. How mm-hmm. does one get such a high quantity of work? Um, so how, how did you need the question? We're trying to kind of yeah, how, what's the, what's the key? What is the key to uh, getting such a wonderful, a uh, plentiful number of gigs? Um, well, the key to that is, um, well, I mainly do library shows because there's, there's so many libraries in each state. So many. You have no idea. I mean, Colorado Association of Libraries, there are around 500 libraries in the state of Colorado and mm-hmm. maybe more, I think. And then just all the surrounding states around me that aren't too far. I know Las Vegas has, like, the city of Las Vegas that district has 14 libraries in that district itself. So, I mean, each state has so many libraries. But what I do to get the gigs is I always call each library each year, and I have a database in my computer of each library that I performed at and um, how they say they want me back and stuff, and I mark that down on my computer. Then I'm actually calling them starting tomorrow. I'm going to start booking shows for this upcoming summer in 2015. Because the library start booking in September, believe it or not. They booked really, really early for next year. And I found that out the hard way last year because I started calling all the libraries that did stuff. And I'm like, oh, we're already booked. Or, and there's some libraries where they have these spots, they've left spots open for me. But um, you always have to think ahead when you're trying to call people. So I just call people way, way ahead of time. And I market myself a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, I went to, um, I won the Joe Leffler Scholarship um, 
for this past year. Yes, congratulations. And, um, yeah, thank you. And I was able to go, I would be honored to go to the Cadaver Convention in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And uh, that was an amazing experience for me. And I learned so many things marketing-wise about what I could do. And I fixed that website up, and I was able to get um, around, I think it was 30, I got 30 quotes. I was able to give 30 quotes within a week when I put a form on my website. I mean, that's the most I've ever had. So um, I put a form on my website um, asking what the gig is, what they want. So um, I have to just put uh, flyers up around Fort Collins and going to school at CSU. So I just put flyers around um, the different community boards and stuff in the city, and parents see that, and I go to daycare centers. I only perform on weekends, though, during the school year, since I am a uh, pre-med student and uh, have to get the good grades and get on school. So definitely just try to do stuff on the weekends during the school year, but during the summer, I try to keep busy all the time. Yes, absolutely. And that's, uh, that's wonderful. And for school... Uh, you're providing such wonderful transitions. You mentioned school. That's the other thing I wanted to ask you because it, it's sort of how all of this ties up. Because uh, I, again, we've talked before, and I, I there's just uh, something here I want to get at. What is your major in school? My major, um, it was biomedical sciences. It was biomedical sciences. Um, I kind of I changed my major to psychology actually because um, I'm a psychology treatment major now because biomedical sciences is more like sitting in a lab, just kind of working on experiments, and that's not what I want to do. I want to interact with people when I become a doctor. I want to be a pediatrician that uses puppets with kids. Um, that is my ultimate goal. My ultimate goal is basically be like the next Dr. Doctor Oz that has a show <laughs> for kids to entertain, to entertain them and teach them about health and safety. That is really the ultimate goal that I have, but as of right now, what I think is in reach at the moment is to um, get the grades, get into med school, and open up a private practice and do all that. So I definitely know that is in reach. I know the, the thing kind of with the TV show, I would take a lot of work and a lot, a lot of marketing, getting my name out there and stuff. So that, that's going to take a while for me to get there. If I do get there, really hope I do. But um, yes, I am a psychology pre-med major now at Colorado State. That is wonderful, and that's why what I wanted to why I wanted to bring it around here is because you have such a high and unique and awesome vision for what you want to do with uh, both your incredible talent uh, and your incredible just smarts for medicine and uh, desire to help people. Uh, that I, I think it is wonderful. Um, when did you know you wanted to go into the medical profession and and um, blend these two together? Yeah. Um. So my little brother, um, Michael Casey, I know a lot of people know him, kind of eventually just mentioned, uh, yes. he was born with teacher colon syndrome. So when I was five years old, uh, I was able, I, there was a lot of medical stuff in our house because um, all the medical stuff, it had to, I mean, it, it, it intrigued me. I really wanted to know more about it. So what I did was I just kind of started reading stuff on the internet and my mom would always say medical term to me. I was like, Oh, I want to know what time it is. So I go on the internet, look at it up, look at it, and then um, when I hit my freshman year in high school, I joined a program called Legacy 2000, the Mass Science and Engineering Program, and I had the opportunity to do an internship and a job shadow. And um, nice. I did my job shadow with someone named Dr. Hal Stein, and he is a pediatrician. He has his own private practice, and that was awesome to see all the kids and stuff walking in and seeing how he interacted with them. It was it was awesome. And I did an internship with uh, someone named Dr. Greg Allen. That's my little brother's uh, um, EMT surgeon. Um, and actually, Dr. Stein, the one I did my job shadow with, is both of our, it, he was both of our pediatricians. So, uh, I mean, both of them I knew very, very well. Dr. Allen, I, I literally know him uh, since Michael was born. So, I know him for basically 15, 16 years. So that was truly an honor to see what he did when I I was actually able to go into the surgery rooms and see what he did with the patients and stuff. And that actually opened my eyes in wanting to become a surgeon. Um, I'm probably I probably just want to focus on just doctor right now and non-surgeon. I may go back to medical school to be a surgeon, but he, 
seeing all the surgery stuff, that was really, really cool. I <laughs> I really like all of that kind of stuff. But yeah, it was really cool to see that. Just I, just the opportunities that I've had to really um, see all the medical stuff that there is. It just opens my eyes and I really want to help people. That's what I want to do with my life. I want to help people. And I know medicine-wise, it's, that's definitely one way I can do it. And it's just an interesting way. I, I love the human body. It's really cool. <laughs> that is wonderful. And that's, again, it's just wonderful to hear you talk about this and how these passions combine. And I want to bring it back around to ventriloquism uh, for yeah. the final question that I always like to ask. Uh, what do you want to see? What do you want to see from this community? What's missing? What uh, What do you want to see in ventriloquism? What do I want to see in ventriloquism? In ventriloquism as this art form progresses. Uh, and, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Where do you see it going? Um. What I want, what I would like to see in the art of ventriloquism, uh, is I want to see it grow. Mm. I want to see more people get involved with the art. I mean, it's, it is such a unique art that, um, oh, I mean, people know about it, and some of my friends, uh, they're just you now reading out that I'm a ventriloquist. Uh, they're like, what? You never told me that. <laughs> Sorry. I, <laughs> and then, uh, they, they're just kind of figuring that out, and, um, uh, but yeah, that's the only thing I would like to see is the community um, to spread the word open to ventriloquism, which is what I'm really starting to do now. And even at, like at libraries, um, if you tell kids how you learned how to do ventriloquism by reading a book, they will go find a book and make an effort to learn it. Actually, this is this is a um, funny thing. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did a show and I said that how they learned it from books. And this little girl went to go check out a book. I saw this little girl just recently, actually, at this past summer. And this was two years ago when I said this. She came to the show, and she had a puppet in her hand, and she was trying to do ventriloquism. I mean, that is the greatest feeling in the world, and you can uh, have that big of an impact on someone, telling them to try something out, and they actually end up loving it. And I think she, her, her mom said she was going to try and go to the ventriloquist convention with her this year. So I really hope I can see her there. I mean... Just from the library show, I mean, that, that's awesome. Just spread the word. That's, that's all I think we need to do. Spread the word and get people involved and interested in it. Spread the word, and that is something you are wonderful at doing. And uh, you have a wonderful head on your shoulders. You're going to go far in no matter what you choose to do because that spirit and desire to help people will carry you far no matter whether it's ventriloquism, medicine, or hopefully uh, both. Thank you so much for being with us today, Megan. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. Thank you, Megan. Nothing but the best is ahead for you, I am absolutely sure. And next week, we have Pastor David Wyrick, who shares his inspiring journey in ventriloquism. Now, before I sign off, I want to tell you, I'm doing a little bit of, I don't know if I want to call it market research, you're just putting feelers out there, or what I want to call it, but I want to know what kind of resources are missing for those of you out there that don't just think of this as a hobby, that you think, okay, a couple years down the line, I'd really like to make this a profession, a full-time profession that I want to perform in. And excuse me, I just bumped the microphone with my hands because even though you can't see me, I'm talking with my hands. I do that all the time. I'm just doing some research. I don't know what will come of it uh, or uh, the direction I want to go with it, but I have some ideas in my head. And uh, if you email in at ventriloquismweekly at gmail.com, I'll tell you a little bit more about what is going on and my thought process, but it's kind of a loose model because I want to know what you think. Again, I want to I want to talk for just a moment to the people who look and say, okay, down the road, 5, 10, or maybe even sooner than that, I want to leave my job or I'm growing up getting out of school and I want to go professional. You look at somebody like, like Megan who's going to uh, uh, add ventriloquism into the profession she's going into, uh, you know, that's wonderful. And then there are people out there who just want to perform full time. And of course, we have hobbyists. That's wonderful. So I just, I want to talk for a second to, or just for this this little experiment, to the people who uh, want to eventually take yourselves pro. I don't want to pigeonhole you. I want to keep it as, as general as possible. But for those of you interested in going pro, what's missing? What kind of resource would be beneficial to you? What are you, is there anything that's making you feel lost in terms of not having this resource? I, again, it's a nebulous idea. I don't even know if, if there'd be something you'd consider. I'm just doing some research to find out why. Um, and again, I don't know what'll come of it or if uh, if anything in general. It's just a, a curiosity I've developed through doing this program and, and um, 
we were working and, and going out to CACs last January or this past January and uh, doing all these things with different ventriloquists. I've discovered a, a passion for helping this community, and um, it's a it's a question that I, I think is worth worth asking, which is what's missing in the realm of resources for those interested in going professional. So I'm going to stop rambling on because I know I tend to repeat myself. So that's it for us this week. Please let me know your thoughts. Uh, you can inbox me on Facebook. You can uh, post in our uh, Facebook group answer to this question or to suggestions for guests, anything else. A reminder, you can find all you need to know about Ventriloquism Weekly by visiting our website, ventriloquismweekly.com. That is the mothership you can get to anywhere that has to do with Ventriloquism Weekly by visiting ventriloquismweekly.com. Reach out by emailing ventriloquismweekly at gmail.com. Again, answer to the question I just asked, or if you just want to drop a note to the show, or you have an idea for a guest, or you want to be on the program yourself, just ventriloquismweekly at gmail.com. And you can find our group on Facebook by searching ventriloquismweekly hyphen podcast for ventriloquists. You can tweet us, you can tweet to us and about us using at T A L K F O R 2 and hashtag T-A-L-K-F-O-R-2, respectively. From New York, signing off for Ventriloquism Weekly, I'm Matt Bailey, reminding all you vents out there to keep talking for two.